my, my plan was to go over like the philosophy of the sale today because the way that I think about the sale is very different and it's even more refined now than what you'll find in the modules. It's just a slight tweak in the, the approach to the sale. Um, but I just first want to start out with this concept that like, I think that the, at least the people that I know in this room have, you, you guys have just greatly underperformed what I think you're capable of doing um, personally. And no amount of me giving any training is actually going to help if there's not this super deep commitment to making it work no matter what. So use this obviously as a resource, but this isn't going to solve like your problems for you. Um, I think it'll help, but it's still going to take like a ton of work outside of any sort of training and on your own and really owning your own outcomes to, to actually make this work. So I don't mean that in any offensive way. I just, as I've watched you guys, especially the, you guys here that I know, um, really well, like there's a lot that you guys can, uh, leave on the field that I just think we haven't tapped into yet. Um, and I do think that this stuff is going to help, but just, you know, it's, it really is all on you guys, frankly. Um, but let's start off with the sale. So there's a couple of things that have changed for me in my understanding of the sale, but I want to just go through you guys that have gone through the training before. What are, what are the steps? Let's talk about the front half of the sale first and then the back half of the sale. Um, so give me the steps of the front half of the sale off the top of your head. Okay. So we've got our intro, which really the intro, I mean, this is everything, including like the greeting, right? Um, and I actually have a, a cool insight here that I want to show you guys. Objections actually, I think is part of the introduction. Smoke screen specifically, not actual objections, but like smoke screens. I think that's a part of it. And I'll tell you why I think that in just a second, but I want to list these out. So what's the next, the next uh, step after the intro? Yeah, so in, intel gathering or fact finding. And this is just questions that you're asking so that you can actually understand the customer. If we're going to sell in a principle centered way, meaning that we're trying to do what's in the customer's best interest, how do you sell to someone that you don't know what's in their best interest? Right? And that doesn't mean determining whether or not they can have the service because hopefully we're knocking in the places which in Denver, there is no problem with this. Like everyone can afford the service. When's the last time you knocked on someone's door and you're like, I don't know if they can afford it. <laughs> not like not in Denver, basically. Um, but this is important because the goal is not just to get someone to commit to the sale. The goal is to let them help them see how our service actually benefits them in a significant way. And that's going to hedge against any cancellation issues. I mean, they're not going to want to leave because they'll understand why our service is good for them specifically, not just good compared to competitors. So it's very customer focused and rather than being competitor focused when we do, um, when we're asking questions and I'll get more into that in a second, but, um, what else, what comes after intelligence gathering or fact finding? Uh, not, not yet. Yes. Um, and really, so yes, building value, but I want to think, I want you guys to think about this slightly differently. So this next section right here is we're trying to take what we know about the customer and their situation. And we're trying to make the value of our service far outweigh the price they will pay for that service. So the equation of the sale is energy in benefits out, right? It's how do I tip the scale to say, the energy you will have to put into getting this sale, that includes, so talk to me about that for a second. What do I mean by that energy in? So if a customer has to put in energy to get something, what does that entail? Yeah. Yeah, so that's actually the, the least obvious one. Almost, like when I say energy, most people don't think of, oh, energy means money. But yeah, money, right? Time, what else? Yep. Why do you, why is it hard to get switchovers for most sales reps? Yeah, because they have in their mind that it's actually a difficult step to make to cancel their service to then get ours. And so they actually then project that onto the customer who then is like, oh yeah, this is a difficult thing, right? Um, so yeah, all of that. So for the energy in, it's, uh, you said, Isaac said, money, time, um, effort to cancel their service. What else? But what is that? What do you, what do we mean by time? If what is, what is the time that someone has to put into getting our service? Yeah. It's the time they have to talk to us. 
And they are, they're valuing that time against what? Family, work, right? Yep. This is why I hate icebreakers that waste people's time because it's just fundamentally saying, hey, I have the highest quality service in the industry, but I'm just going to waste your time for five minutes before we talk about it. It's like people hate that. That's, that's, that is the way to never sell to someone in a wealthy neighborhood. Um, any, any other things you can think of in terms of like the energy part of the equation that a customer puts into getting what we... Yeah, yeah. The what the customer will have to deal with on the back end with their spouse. Oftentimes, that's going to be a smokescreen, but still, that's valid for sure. Okay, so that is the what they're going to have to put in. Also, it's just the hassle of what it takes to sign up. So, if you ask them, have to ask them a million questions to sign the agreement, then and you got to go in and you got to have dinner together, and then you like it's like that's that is just as much of a hassle. In fact. Um, if you make it seem like you have to get the spouse's permission for everything, and I'm not saying don't get the spouse's permission. I'm not saying you sell a bunch of one layers, but most of the time you actually don't need it. So if you are saying that they have to get the spouse's permission, then you're just putting more work on them. Um, and so that's also part of it too. My, my whole point with this is like this whole section of the sale, I call this the presentation. And the reason why it's called the presentation instead of just features and benefits is because what we're trying to do is tip the scale in favor of value to say what you get out of my service is far exceeds. Um, many sales trainers will say you need the value to exceed the price by 10 X at least. Cause I want the customer to get the service and say, man, yeah, we paid more than we paid for any other service, but the value is at least 10 times what we paid. So that's what we're trying to do in the presentation. So this includes features and benefits. This includes price. Um, and it's basically, we're trying to make the argument of like, what do you get out of the service and how is that at least 10 times more valuable than what, the price that you're going to pay for it? And not just money, but the energy you're going to put in. Yeah. Um, just going back to the whole smoke screen thing, that was what Jason brought up. I was talking to um, Jason and Joel, like, Joel and we're, we're going through the online like training. Um, and a lot of it is based on really focusing on the smoke screen. Mm -hmm. Hundred percent, yeah. So the one for the spousal objection is work up for great and you know you can do that ten hour training with your spouse and that can just completely blow it away so you don't have to think about that for ten hours. Right. Yeah, the hundred percent for sure. And what's actually happening there is quite a bit deeper than just getting rid of smoke screens. Yeah. There's a psychological factor happening there that's that's a bit deeper, but um that will help you understand how to ask the best questions, but We'll get to that in just a second. Um, okay, so, so far we've got the, the intro, which includes the greeting. And in my opinion, it actually includes overcoming smoke screens or cutting through smoke screens is how I like to think of it. Um, if we're going to use the word smoke, like it just, I think of like, yeah, it's, it, smoke is nothing. It's just, it's there and there's no density to it. So you can easily just cut through them. Um, and then we go to Intel gathering and then we're going to go into the presentation portion of our sale. And then really, I like to think of the close as its own separate thing because um, really you need to you need to understand and see that as you're closing someone the first time there's a very specific way you should do it uh, so the, I would say the close of the last part of the front half of the sale okay now take me to the back half of the sale this one might be a little more tricky to remember but walk me through the steps of the back half of the sale Yeah, so I'm going to include a customer objection, an actual objection here. Customer smoke. It's still going to be a smoke screen because we want to treat this first objection as a smoke screen still. So we're actually going to include how the customer responds here as part of the back half because it'll help us understand what we do a bit better. Um, okay, so yeah, after that. It's checking in. It's, it's okay, because what I'm doing tends to make yes. like what I'm doing. This is called deflecting. So we completely want to deflect this first um, objection in the back half of the sale. And we're going to do it very specifically. So we're using the, it's, uh, you know, do you like the idea? Does it make sense? And we're specifically going to say this in a hypothetical tonality. So no matter what the customer says here, we don't need to understand or, sorry, we don't need to memorize 10 different ways to overcome an objection there. Because what was the way you guys used to do this when a customer, you close on the first time, they're like, you know, just give me a card. Let me think about it. 
<laughs> so that's how we would teach like the rookie to do it. It's like, yeah, just say the same thing every time, even though it makes zero sense. You're just going to try to make, you're going to try to win their confidence with your confidence by cutting through it again. Um, or if you're a more experienced rep, what are you going to do here? Uh, you know, just give me a card. Let me, let me think about it. You can just respond specifically to that one. Or if I'm like, I just got to talk with my wife. Let me think about it. Yeah, I don't want you sleeping on the couch over pest control. Uh, or it's like, you know, I, I, I need it, but I just, I'm with another service right now and I really don't want to have the hassle to, ha hassle to cancel them. I don't know if we're in a contract. Well, here's the thing about contracts. And you just like address them directly. And now you have to memorize. You're like, okay, how do I teach this? Well, all right, if you're going to sell like me, you have to memorize 51 liners for this one objection after the sale. And by the way, they don't work super well either. So you're going to have to go 12 objections deeper than you should. Um, so the reason why that, that I'm pointing this out because I don't like that. And there's a way easier way. You have to assume that this, this first objection after you close the first time is always a deflection. Excuse me. It's always a smoke screen that you need to deflect again. And the way you do it is with a hypothetical. You say, hey, so, you know, based on everything that I've said so far, notice how my voice inherently is, is speaking in hypothetical. Hypothetically speaking, and I'm not going to say the words hypothetical, but my tone of voice, my tonality will be the hypothetical money aside. Um, does everything make sense to you? Like, is it at least appealing to you to go with me? Maybe not today, but down the road. Now that completely puts down their guard and they're going to answer honestly to you. So then the customer is going to give you an answer, whatever they say. And then you're going to reiterate. Yeah, and that's why people really love the service. I mean, you can you can clearly see why people love it is because, yeah, we, we start with the yard, but fundamentally we're just training things differently. And now, now you get kind of the idea why people are signing up right now. And he's like, yeah, yeah, okay, cool. But now, the, listen, the real beauty is, and then you're going to go into the next thing. So what, what, what we're doing here, we're deflecting, answering, asking something in the hypothetical. They're going to give us an answer. And then we reiterate the value so that we can make sure that they understand, or this is re reiterating or checking in. Um, check in. And I, we don't need to worry about the back half today. I just want to get it all out on paper so you can see kind of the complexity of a full sale. Um, after the, we reiterate, then we're going to transition. And I really like just coming up with phrases that help trigger the next step in my mind. So if, I'm going to say, yeah, but the real beauty about what I do is this, this, and this. And really, that's going to give us our next block of value, which is presentation number two or value number two. So is it, if this is presentation number one, then presentation number two comes after this. So we're going to really sure up value, and it's going to be more of the logical case. Then you're going to check in. Um, there's a bunch of different things you do, but give me the rest of like the blocks here. What else are we doing? Anybody remember the next other steps in the back half? Huh? Forrest Gump comes next. Yep. Yep. And then worst case, best case. And then we're going <laughs> to, um, we add on pain because we're trying to lower, specifically lower the action threshold, right? And there's one or two loops you can do after that, but that's typically where you're going to get. And if someone doesn't buy right there, it means they actually can't afford the service or they're really, they're truly not in the position to actually buy. And they're kind of dragging you along. But if there's a viable customer, you'll sell them no matter what, if they let you get to that point. So um, the reason I wanted to go through the whole back half of the sale is because the thing I most hear, like the coolest part of the back half of the sale is the Forrest Gump pattern. Um, who could demonstrate that for me really quickly or just tell me what it is actually? Chris, what's the Forrest Gump pattern? Explain it to me. Just you know, If you're trying to teach someone for the first time, how would you teach it? <laughs> it's it's um, getting personal with them. And it's, I think the Forrest Gump, you can just introduce yourself. Can't say this is Chris. Or yeah. tell them about, um, you're just trying to raise the three cents. Right? Yep. You as a salesperson, yeah. Um, the company, and yep. So you can mention something about, hey, here's our rating. Um, get in touch with right. <laughs> So yeah, the force gun pattern is exactly as you said, shoring up 
the three tens, which the three tens are in, in order for anyone to buy, they have to be sure of three different things. They have to be sure that the service is better for them than their current situation. They have to be sure that you as the sales rep are telling the truth about the service and are actually saying it accurately. So they need to trust you. And then they also have to be sure that the company is going to stand behind everything you say. Those three things have to be, be at a reasonably high level for them to take action. Now it's, it gets more complicated because if they have a high action threshold, those things, three things need to be up to like 10. But if they're in a moment of pain in their life, meaning like they have bugs, they've tried three different services, they're just not working, they'll go with anyone that comes to their door next, then they only need those three things to be at like a five. But at, at any rate, someone ha has to have certainty on those three things in order to buy from you. Service, you, and the company. But it's not just logical certainty. They have to understand the dollars and cents of it. They have to understand like why you're trustworthy, logically speaking. But then they also have to understand uh, emotionally. So there's two different sides. There's the logical and the emotional side. You don't need to worry a ton about that. I'm just getting at how like complex this becomes. The reason the Forrest Gump pattern is so cool is because it solves the problem of the complexity of the sale with one section. So basically someone gives me the objection here. Um, like I'll role play with you, Chris, and do the, the Forrest Gump pattern. So I'm going to give my presentation. Really, if right here I talked about the features and benefits of the yard and fundamentally how we treat this differently and our trustworthiness as a company, here I might talk about specific features and benefits and I'll say, now do you kind of see what I'm saying, Chris, about um, why people have been signing up with us? Is, is it making more sense? And as I stated before, I definitely want you to, to think about it and take your time for sure, as much time as you need. But let me just ask you a question. So now I'm going to go into the force gun pattern. Always preface with asking permission to ask a question. Um, based on everything that I've said, well, actually, let me ask you this. If you had used my service in the past and you already knew how good it was, let's say you're like in a different home. Now you move to this home and you're like, hey, Moxie, I you guys, used you guys before. You're amazing. How hard would it be to sign up with me right now? Right, because you'd used it before, right? But the truth is, you've never used my service, so you, you don't know me. I don't have a track record with you. So, of course, you're not signing up right away. So, what have I done right there? That's just the first part of the Forrest Gump pattern. I've kind of backed you into a psychological corner and made you admit that the only reason you're not buying is because you don't trust me. So, how do I know that, though? Because you answered yes, you would go with me if you had already had an experience with it. And... The cool part about this is, is once you get an answer yes to that, you're basically one close away from getting the sale. You're in. Yeah, it's like as soon as someone answers yes to that, I'm like, all right, just don't screw it up basically from here or like hope that like a pack of dogs doesn't come out of the, the house or something. Um, so so then the next thing is, but wh why don't they trust me though? It's because they don't have, I don't have a track record with them, but they're also not on a familiar basis with me yet. So the way you get someone to trust you, this is why it's called the Forrest Gump pattern is because Forrest doesn't get on the bus until they are on a first name basis. It's like, well, my mom says not to talk to strangers. And then she's like, well, I'm, I don't remember what her name is. Gail or something. It's like some, yeah, whatever a bus driver's female Southern bus driver would be named. I don't know. Um, hopefully that's not offensive. Uh, I realize it could be potentially, but what, so basically they were not on a first name basis. And then, now they are and he's like well i guess we're not strangers anymore and he makes it he gets on the bus so that's what you're doing here now chris if you if if i already had a track record with you and you'd used my service before or let's say like your best friend had used it and was like hey you need to go with moxie next time they come by it'd probably be pretty easy to go with me right and that's fair but the reason why you're not is because of course you don't know me so now i'm empathizing you don't know me i've never done business with you before let me just reintroduce myself and tell you a little bit about why people have actually loved working with me personally so when I say that, now I'm doing what Forrest and the bus driver did is they're going to get on a first name basis. And just remember the first time that you said your name, if at all, was at the very beginning of the sale. So you're still just a sales rep to them trying to sell them. But when I say, you know, my name's Hayden. And while I'm pretty good at this job of selling people pest control door to door, I actually really pride myself in my customers having a great experience so that after I leave, um, they really are. It's not just about me signing them up, but like they're actually going to their lives, their homes are going to be in more comfort because of using my my service. I'm really rusty with this. So I'm stumbling over my words. But and as for my company, so I just reaffirmed what my intentions actually are for them, making it easier to trust me. Right. Which means now if you understand logically why the service is so good, now you're also going to think, oh, you know what? 
I actually like this Hayden guy. And I didn't even remember that that was, that was his name. And he's openly admitting he's a sales rep, but he actually really cares about customers. That's pretty cool. So now we're on a first name basis again. Now you trust me, which means you trust everything I've now said about the service. And now I'm going to say, and as for my company, that's the transition into building up the third 10, which is the company. And as for my company, check this out. So I know we don't have a five-star review, but 4.9 is pretty close. Um, we're widely known, and we're not the biggest company in the Denver area, but we're, we're widely known as having the highest quality service. And so, you know, I, I think that if you go with us, you're really going to have that same experience. Although I could be wrong because you just never know, right? There's a reason why that's not five stars. There's 4.9. But really, that's what we're so good at is making sure that no matter what your experience is, we're always treating your home as if it's our own, even if that means making it up to you, if there's ever an error. So like now that I say that, they're like, geez, I just knocked over those two dominoes that I hadn't before. And people start buying right there. So then you do your triconal close. So I'm not asking for anything crazy here. Like, let's just take things slow. Okay. I'm not asking you to get married to me, but give me a shot. Try it out for 12 months. And if it's even half as good as everybody else, I think you're really going to love it. Does that sound fair? So that's my triconal close. Certainty, sincerity, reasonable man. Um, and I'm going fast here and overwhelming with the knowledge because you can watch this back and, and listen to it. But okay, so here, why am I spending so much time on the Forrest Gump pattern? It's because the number one thing I hear from sales reps is that it doesn't work. Have you guys ever tried this and you're like, Forrest Gump pattern doesn't work? Right word. Yeah, how often have you tried that and actually thought it? Because in the modules, I make it look like. In the, in the training, I make it look like that is the best thing since, you know, inventing the wheel or sliced bread, right? Which it really is. But then does it actually work for you guys as well as it would appear it should? Most people will probably say no, actually. The reason why I think that is, is because they suck at everything in the front half of the sale. So Forrest Gump didn't work right here. It really started breaking down right here because you don't even have their trust yet. You're just trying to bulldoze through every step. Um, and that's fundamentally why I'm trying to approach this this way is because I think especially with your guys' group, this is not the case with most, with, with not most, with I would say probably two thirds of the sales reps that I work with. But I see this a lot in your guys' group that you're, mo you're seeing this sale as a list of things to check off rather than as checkpoints to bring a customer through. So you're going through the sale and you're saying, my name's Hayden, uh, my manager is Moxie, blah, 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 blah. Then they give you a smoke screen and you just cut through it and you maybe ask one question. You guys have a service, right? Who are you guys currently using? Okay, have you seen them treat? Blah, 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 blah. What do you know if you ask, hey, who's your service and have you seen them treat? What do I know about their situation? Virtually nothing. But that's what you guys do, right? Those are the only questions you typically ask someone that gives you objections right here because you're just check it off. And then you're like, man, I don't know why I didn't get that sale. I did everything I was supposed to. And so instead of being able to evaluate why you didn't get it, you're just like, well, I, I just, and then you start developing biases towards customers. So you're like this type of neighborhood, hate that neighborhood, that type of customer, hate that customer. Why? Because you don't have the ability to take ownership for anything related to your sale because you're just viewing it as boxes, the check rather than as what I would like to teach you guys tonight, which is checkpoints to bring the customer through. And this is what I think I have not done a good enough job at teaching in the modules that will it's going to change very quickly. Um, is these you need to view. Yes, they are blocks of the sale. It's good to understand what to do, but you need to start viewing them as checkpoints to bring your customer through. And you can't move on to the next thing unless you bring your customer through those checkpoints. So what do I mean by that? All right. Let's talk about the purpose for each of these things because that's really going to help us understand what I'm, what I'm saying by checkpoints because I realize that it could be a tiny bit confusing right now. What is the whole purpose of the introduction? Trust. Yep, it's about trust. Um, talk to me a little bit more about that. Is there anything else we're trying to do there? What does tr building trust mean? Rapport is the other word I would use, yep. Yeah. Listen, attention. Okay. I would say so far these two are definitely the main ones. All these are kind of ancillary byproducts of that, but um, 
what like what are the things we're trying to be perceived as in how do we build trust within our brand yeah so this really has to do with you're showing that you're an expert what else Okay, that's not going to happen in the intro, though. That's going to happen right here. But you're laying the groundwork for that to happen, importantly. Yeah. Because you can't really even get to there if they don't trust you, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, you're not just trying to say, hey, this is me. Hopefully you ask a buying question, but if you don't, I'm going to bulldoze through everything you say. And then hopefully I can confidence you into buying from me, which is literally how everyone sells. I, I, as I go through, like I try to keep up on what people are doing in our industry that proclaim that they're the best. And that's all I see them doing. I don't see any nuanced like understanding of what's happening in the psychology and how to make that so you can train any type of person. It's really just about confidencing your way into, well, frankly, I think most trainers don't understand even what they do well. So. Ha has to for sure. Um, but what I mean by bulldozing and like confidencing your way into a sale is like you give me an objection and I just keep basically ignoring it the whole time and then just moving on to the next thing. And then I move on to the next thing. And then I give, I hopefully can give enough features and benefits to spark your interest. And then I close. But then I, oh, whenever I close, I only alternative close you so that I'm trying to, it, it, I'm perceived as trying to trick you into buying the entire time. And so people will either, <laughs> Uh, people will either just buy because they just want you to leave and they're beta enough to buy, which is that th this is actually why the industry has such poor contract values up into this year's because then they just end up knocking in neighborhoods that feel most comfortable. Why? Because you can get away with that in neighborhoods that are like more middle, lower class neighborhoods. They'll let you do that and they'll finally just buy. But then what do they do? They cancel and they call after and then you're like, you're pissed about the customer. And then you start blaming the customer because you don't have an ability to take responsibility for the sale yourself and their ability to make the decision. And so then it's just, that's where all the biases form. That's why everyone loves knocking certain areas, certain markets, certain whatever. Um, yeah, as I digress. Okay, this is good. Expert, you're trying to be perceived as enthusiastic. That goes into building trust. And I would say the way you're trying to be perceived as different is genuine. And this is what Chris was getting at is like, we're not just trying to be perceived as confident. We are trying to be perceived as genuine and confident because that is basically the message I'm trying to get across when I am knocking is like, I am different in, from everyone else knocking your door in the sense that I actually care about solving the problems that you have. And maybe even the ones you don't realize you have. Um, okay. So that's the whole pillar you're trying to knock down at the beginning of the sale is trust. What are you trying to do in the intel gathering phase or the questions? Asking specific questions. Yes. So, so you do need information. That's, that's like really important. And that seems like to be the most obvious one, right? Yes. So, and part as part of gathering information, you're trying to qualify the customer. Well, actually, I would flip these two. I would say like you're trying to qualify the customer by gathering information. Um, that is actually the biggest thing you are doing in this is deepening rapport. So, and if I were to list this in order, I would say you're deepening rapport. Then, um, like if this was a hierarchy of like what you're trying to accomplish here, then. Yeah, because like the only reason someone's even going to listen to you, there's only a couple of reasons why someone would even listen to you this far. It's because they don't have anything better to do and they like playing and toying with salesmen. Like they're so sick of them that they'd rather not cuss you out and have you leave. Um, typically women will do this if they're sick of talking to door to door salesmen or men that are like annoyed but kind of beta. They'll do it a little bit too where they'll just like listen, listen, listen. Uh -huh, mm -hmm, and then you won't pick up on their social cues. And then you get there. And then they're just, they're just like playing with you the whole time. Um, and then it doesn't work and you're like pissed that it doesn't work. But it's because you never had their trust in the first place and you didn't deepen rapport with them. And you don't even know enough about their situation. So you're deepening rapport. Um, you're qualifying them. You're, you're definitely showing expertise. That's also part of deepening rapport. Um, this isn't the most organized way to list this, but I'm just putting things there. 
the biggest thing you're doing is deepening report and qualifying. And you're also gathering enough information to best serve them. So you're trying to understand how to best serve them. And as a byproduct of understanding that, of how to best, sorry for anyone that takes pictures of this, it is not my best handwriting day. Um, you're trying to understand how to best serve the customer. As a byproduct of trying to understand how to best serve the customer, they will feel that you actually care about them. So it's not this manipulation tactic. You actually really are trying to understand how the service best applies to them. Okay, so then what are you doing? Once you know this, I also I forgot my favorite part of this right here is actually the transition. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Transition from questions to the presentation. What is it? Oh, dude, I, just, I, I love this part of the sale because like if they're if they've listened here, I know how easy the sale is going to be actually based on how this transition goes. So this isn't a make or break for the sale. Just you know how easy it's going to be. If they let you ask questions, then I'm like, cool, I got trust. I've deepened rapport. And then I say, listen, <laughs> I, I mean, I don't mean to jump the gun here, but based on everything you just said, I think this is going to be a really good fit. And then by that time, they're just like, it does. it's just try not to mess it up because they'll usually buy right after price. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and then if you can throw in something specific, especially what you guys said, what you said about the kids and worrying about fire ants. I mean, this is going to be, again, I don't want to like put the cart before the horse here, but this is, this could definitely be a no brainer for you guys, but let's just see though. Okay. So the first thing, and then you go into your presentation. Um, so that transition here is really cool. Um, now I, the reason why it's important that I mention this here, what are you trying to do in this transition? This I would call your thesis or the hook. And this is different than the hook in the intro. This is just like your hook for why they should listen to the features and benefits. What is that doing if I, if I say that and they're actually listening? Like, listen, based on everything you said, you're going to love this. This is going to be great for you guys. Yep. And as, as it's doing that, it builds value in what you're about to say. So... What did you say? Yep. And it will be if they're listening and they and you've asked the right questions. Um, so it builds anticipation and it also builds value in what you're about to say. Just by fa by the fact of you saying that, it's going to make them listen to everything. They'll hang on every word on when you get here. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, for sure control as well okay this is getting messy you'll have to really bear with me when we get to this next part okay so then when i do the presentation what am i trying to do in the presentation we basically already went over this with the sales equation but what is the objective if i were to just summarize this in terms of like this is the goal i'm trying to accomplish at this point of the sale okay so um fill the need uh, fill their need with the value that we provide for them. So you, you're basically going to personalize that value to them in a way. Um, what else are we accomplishing there? Yeah, uh, actually different way to look. So not company yet, service. Yep, exactly. Um, this is going to be all about the logical case. So whoops, we need to, we need to really build this logical case here. And, and this is about logical certainty. Yeah. And the reason why I'm, there's a bunch of different things you're doing here. There's a sales equation and energy and benefits out certainty. Um, but why I want you to picture this as the logical case is because if we're going to think about the sale in terms of checkpoints that we have to take the customer through, you can't leave them behind. It's really hard to move on from this section if they don't understand why our service is better logically for them. There is no way you're getting the sale if they don't understand why it's better logically, unless they just like you, in which case they will cancel before November 30th because then they won't see how the service applies to them. Maybe they won't be home for the services. So any minor problem that they have that's going to be way less than with other companies, they'll view that as like, well, Adam promised me that it was going to be the best service and I only signed up for Adam. And so therefore, like there's a whole bunch of problems if you don't present this as a logical case for them. And then there is a, per the reason why I listed this as its own thing, there is a whole purpose for the close. And what is that? 
just from your guys' perspective, I'm not asking like guess the, what the teacher's thinking here. So um, we almost always want to assume that we're not going to get the real objection after this. But what did you say, Luke? I love that. See where they're at. So yes, we are trying to close them to get the sale. But the reason why we're going to structure this differently than an alternative close is because we def we want to know if they how how ready they are to buy if at all yet. So this is going to draw out if I just ask for the sale right here rather than saying so you want the garage treated as well and they're like I mean if I do it but how much does that cost and now we're on to a whole another set of problems and you just basically derailed everything you did yeah. I think it shows that yes, it makes you very upfront. Yeah. Oh, Yes. So we're going to assess where they are. And then the way I would state this is like move them along. So, and that has everything to do with showing that like you're there to ask for the sale. Now that most people, because they don't know how to ask for the sale correctly, they'll perceive that as like a negative thing. But if you do it with a tritonal close, it's like, it's really beautiful. It's, it's brilliant. So <clears throat> um, now that we've gathered like the steps for the sale here. Now, like if I was, uh, I have to apologize for you guys that are here for the first time with us because <clears throat> if I was trying to train to show like how cool our training was, I would try to do it a little bit differently and not go as deep because this can get kind of confusing. Um, meaning I'm not being as like eloquent maybe as you would be if you're trying to like present this all like uh, fancy or whatever. But we're, I'm trying to get you guys to understand what these checkpoints actually are so that you can have flexibility to work within them. Because um, again, too many of the reps that I've seen from your guys' group are just going through the checkpoints, or excuse me, just checking boxes. And you're saying, hey, oh, I memorized the script, but then it's like, why is it not working? It's because you're not actually taking the customer through the checkpoints. The script is the first level of understanding how to do that, but then you have to work flexibly within it. Okay, so these are, what we're going to call our checkpoints and we could boil these down into even more simple terms but you know i wanted you guys to really think through what they were yourselves um how do things change when you are trying to take the customer through checkpoints rather than just checking boxes give me some thoughts on that yeah john totally yeah and if you can, th I don't expect anyone to remember this, but anytime I've trained with you guys as a group during the summer, that is always the number one feedback I'll give anyone in a group role play setting. It's like, stop talking at me and talk with me as a customer. But this fixes that. Yeah, Luke, what's up? Um, oh, I was going to say that if you do it from that scenario, it's like really violent. Which really means you need to work on your front half, actually. <laughs> a really good back half of the sale is just because of a good front half this is like it's the back half is actually the easiest part of the sale my personal opinion okay anyway go ahead uh so i mean if you look at it that way it's just kind of like ineffective like it allows you to look at it from a different person's point of view and be like oh man like i can really yeah checkpoints it's a lot less effective and more like manipulative and like totally yeah, it actually requires more thought because when you're there, you have to really be engaged and care about the customer. I personally think that a lot of reps that don't do it this way, they're really selfish on the doors. They're just like, they're only thinking about themselves. So if you want to fit, so a lot of the problem that sales reps have if they're trying to make a jump from, let's say low end of 60 to 100K in revenue to like two, three, 400K in revenue is they get really caught up in their own emotions on the doors. Why would you get caught up in your own emotions on the doors? Because you're constantly just thinking about yourself. You're like, I said this, I did this, I, I did all the things that they told me to do in the training. I've been working really hard. I've been blah, 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 blah. You know what happens when you start focusing on the customer? You just amazingly, I mean, this is revolutionary. You forget about yourself because you can't think about two people at the same time in the same thought. So now that you're hyper-focused on the customer and you're really trying to assess like, do they actually trust me yet? Okay, maybe that thing I did didn't work to get them to trust me. What could I do next within my expertise to help them trust me? Okay, I know I can't move on to questions and see if this is in their best interest so they don't trust me. So like, I got to solve that first. Now you're focused on them. You'll stop having emotional days on the doors. 
because you're not thinking about yourself and all the things that you did that you wish would have worked and they didn't. Does that make sense? This solves so many problems. Yeah. This is just like, why did that happen to you? And it also, in your mind, it just clear as day will make sense where you lost people. You'll know what you need to work on in your training because you're like, because in your mind, you have to think about what checkpoint am I at? I know they trust me. I already got intel. Man, my, my presentation just must not be that logically buttoned up yet because I'm only getting, you know, four or five people to even let me give price. But I know they trust me. So like, what's wrong there? Well, it's easy. What's wrong is like your logical case sucks, you know? So then you go consult the script and you say, what words could I use that I'm not using? Um, what other things could I, could I use visual tools or aids that like help me? Do I like that even? Like what makes me feel more comfortable? All of that stuff. How am I giving price? Yeah. That's why it's fun is because you're not lost. You're like, crap, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm working so hard. Why am I not getting more sales? It's like, you're not getting more sales because you're not understanding how to get them because you're so focused on you that you're not like looking at where the customers you're losing them. Yeah. I definitely caught myself too, like thinking about that. Like even when you're selling someone, having them like thinking about, am I doing what's right here? Or is this a risk of them? Yeah. Like, oh, did I say that intro right? Or did I do that? Right? <laughs> Instead of, like, I promise, Aiden, I'm happens. saying it right. Like so many times, like, yeah, you know, like cool. alpha males crying on the yeah. with me. I'm like, come here, buddy. It's fine. Like, you know, we've all been there. And they're like, I'm, I promise I'm saying everything you told me to do. I'm saying it all. I'm like, dude, I know. I get it. It's fine. But like, how do you feel like the customer's feeling when you give your intro? And they're like, I don't know. I'm just saying everything I'm supposed to be like, see, there you go. That's the problem right there. <laughs> Girls don't do that on the door. They don't do that, right? Get cry because you have a bad day because all the guys do that for sure. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Come on, we all know we've cried on the curb many more times than any girl that's ever knocked. Yeah. No. Um. So this goes deeper into more of specifics, like the application of this stuff. But presentation number one is always going to, at least in my, so this also, I don't want to throw a wrench into anybody's processes quite yet because we're already doing that. Most of you guys do features and benefits in presentation number one. I stopped doing that a long time ago. I give a full, a broad sweeping overview of why someone would love our service. So, because what is, what are all of our competitors saying? We start in the yard. Then we do this, then we do that. And like, well, that's what the guy before said. And you're like, uh, he probably, yeah. <laughs> so what makes you different? Well, we actually do the things that we said that the guy, yeah. So like how, how, how compelling of a logical case is that? Is like company XYZ uh, or APT, uh, they, they go and knock the door and they're like, our service, we start at the yard, we treat all the way to the back fence. And then you come by and you're like, we're starting at the yard. We treat all the way to the back fence. You're like, yeah, but the guy from AP whatever said that too. And you're like, yeah, but here's the thing, man. We actually do it. You're like, wow, that is so certainty buttoned up with that. You know, that's so deep. So instead, what I do with this one is, I, man, I said I wasn't going to throw. All right, we're just going to go here. So what I do with this one is like, I'll say, listen, the reason why people use us is because we treat, we have the, the, we have the expertise to treat up to 70% more pest issues that are unforeseen in your home than any of our competitors. Um, we are proactively going to attack those things from the source. We rotate our products every season so that the bugs don't get used to those things. And yeah, like you don't have to worry. We treat every inch of your property and that goes from back to front, top to bottom, no matter your issue. And, and on top of that, we train our, our technicians in a way that's very different. Do you realize that like if you were to go just throw – if you put like 10 people in front of you that all work for different pest control companies and you just randomly chose you know, nine of them, you probably would have nine or eight, eight or nine people that they've never been trained more than once a quarter on how to treat your home. So basically they're spraying and praying. With me, we don't do that. We actually spend millions of dollars a year training our technicians every single day. So have I talked about one feature and benefit yet? How much more compelling is that? Because now you actually have a picture in your mind of like, man, this is awesome. And, and, and we don't just train our technicians on expertise of, of the service. So like every one of our technicians is licensed at the level that an entomologist has to be licensed when they leave school. That's crazy. You're not going to find that except for maybe the top person, maybe the owner of the company that you've used in the past. 
in addition to that, we're teaching our technicians and our staff on like how to talk to you in a way that like your day is actually better. Let's say you have a problem with bugs and you call us, your day is going to be better by the time you get off the phone with us than when you started. So that's why everybody loves it. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. So no, normally for my service and now I'm going to get, so I haven't even given one feature benefit yet. Now I'm going to go into price. What does that leave me open to do in presentation number two? Now I can say, hey, listen, I didn't even mention the cool part about the spiders. You guys have the spider problem that's recurring, right? So we do this, <laughs> I mean, just the name is cool. It's this multi-tiered organic spider treatment. All you need to know about that is we treat from the roof all the way down for spiders with a product that keeps them away much longer. And the reason why that's going to be important for you is because you mentioned to me that your, your wife signed up for pest control. She hate the spiders. So that's going to keep them out of the house. Nothing worse than having your kids screaming, waking up and ruining bedtime and your time together, right? Because they hate the spiders. But it's also going to make it so they're not laying future eggs there and then you have an infestation later on. So it's not just about any individual one. It's about the future problems too. You see what I'm saying here? Okay. And you also mentioned the ants. So now I can go into very specific things, but I'm going to make them customer focused, not features and benefits focused. Following me here? So much more powerful if you do it that way. And you just immediately, do, you will never have someone say, well, the guy from so-and-so said that they do that too. Just won't ever happen again. Until they all start copying our training, which that's why they say those things is because they copy our training really early on, like years ago. Yeah, what were you going to say something, Luke? Are we good on time? I'm just kind of riffing here. I don't know if this is... Oh, yeah. Okay. How are you guys feeling about this so far? Okay, give me some feedback. Um, yes. It's a, it's a lot of fun because once you I can't even tell you the feeling of when like you look down a street and you're like so excited to go knock doors because people are home because you can actually control the sales outcome of your day. Like, you know, I'm feeling pretty good today. If I knock all these doors, I'm most likely going to sell 10 people today unless something crazy happens because you're actually in control. This allows you to be in control of it. Um, other takeaways so far. What specifically actually are you excited about? I'd be curious to I'm hear that. I'm really excited about like the slow storage bugs because it's just like something. Cool. I feel like I got like a lot of things up my sleeve to like get to Very nice. Yeah, and you can do really a ton. So if you're not boxing yourself into a certain script there, there's a lot you can say that would make someone want to trust you as a person. You know, I was captain of my high school football team and uh, <laughs> <laughs> just like start pulling out. On my uh, little league baseball team, um, I was just known as being the most honest, something like that. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, what else? What else are takeaways for you guys so far? I like how <laughs> Abs and Luke. Um, just how you're able to. Because um, I think like if you focus on the customer, you learn a lot more. And I think just like also realize how much you can control um, like maybe having them in your system right? yeah people leaving that door that they're not buying because they're like oh, I'm just gonna walk in <laughs> yeah um, really like get deeper into it and it comes to like their whole training plan and like just why they were even bought and like just what they're doing and like yeah Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay. Um, Luke, what were you going to say? Take away. Um, I was going to say that I love the presentation one. <laughs> the, like broad, broad strokes. Yeah. You, you're dejected at that point too because you're like, you know what? I mean, he's not wrong. It is the exact same. Also, and then you start blaming them too. You're like, man, I just hate that they do that. They just freaking copy our stuff. They're liars. And they were like, they're like, who cares about them? This is like a you problem, you know? This is not a, a anyone else outside of me. 
Oh, you guys sound the same. He's like, you know what? Man, these guys making my job hard because now I have to tell you why we're really different. Let me tell you something. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. <laughs> Centralizing and transition, you don't have to come up with a few different ways to get from one miner to the next miner. Literally, streamlining the same thing in the same way. Yeah. It makes it so simple. And, and that's how, like, so um, I want to be careful with how we talk about that stuff too, because. Yes, there is a, a thing you can use that's kind of copy and paste for every scenario, but the highest level method of selling, like, re I'm, I'm not talking about like. If I was going to try to train you guys on selling four accounts a day, this would not be the training. Oh, it, literally, it would be who was saying the, I think it was you guys here that was like, yeah, I'd literally just be like, you know what, just say this and uh, you'll at least find four people that'll buy with that script. Um, cut through all smoke screens, address every objection you can, maybe even just be super friendly with the customer and don't talk about sales until they trust you and then like get a pity sale. Like you could do that four times a day pretty easy. I'm this, this, these concepts here about taking people through the roadmap and the checkpoints and not leaving them behind. I'm going to, so I'll use the last 15 minutes here to tell you what I really mean by that. Like I'll give you some examples too. This is so that you can sell like 10 accounts a day. And I'm not over exaggerating by saying that. And that's even small. If you can knock a full day and be talking to a hundred people a day, one tenth of the people that listen to you, if you actually show that you care and take them through the roadmap, only one out of 10 people the when i really started applying this stuff and guys i like i sucked so bad at sales starting and like this is all stuff i really had to learn on my own through a lot of trial and error it doubled easily doubled my best revenue day for day my best summer previous to this was selling 400 accounts managing a team and in a third even a fourth of the time serviced 500 accounts while managing uh, 150 people and that was with only knocking really about four hours a day. There was not a day that I was like, I think I can probably get 10 today. But it's because just everything changed about my mindset of being able to bring people through the roadmap. It wasn't any charisma thing. It was like, it was a shift in focusing on the customer in a way that it, we just never have before. Um, so like this is, this is the sell 10 a day minimum training that if you can start applying it, it's going to be fun. So what we're going to do in future trainings is I want to go through each part of the each checkpoint and start to try to understand all right what are the different methods we could use to get a customer through those checkpoints and how do we get so good that on the fly you can come up with the right questions to ask um and really not you know we, that's the where the practice is going to come is like getting versatile with like okay you just told me that um let's see what's a great example of this that you're using another service and that you're happy with them what questions would I ask that type of person if that's all that I knew? And how would I phrase those questions? Because you wouldn't just go say, hey, so uh, you've seen your service treat, right? They do this and this and this. He just told me he's happy with them. So why am I going to start doing anything that would remotely look like I'm going to bash on the company? Because that's what it'll feel like to them, even if I'm not. So instead, I might say, hey, you know, sorry, what was your name again? John? Okay, John. So John, I don't even know if this is a good fit for you or not, but that's my whole job and why I really love working for moxie is because i'm trying to do i'm trying to help you understand how our service could potentially be better for your life and that's regardless of who you're using currently um why did you guys even sign up for pest control by the way if you don't mind me asking okay so it's for the ants all right and is the concern about the ants that you guys have kids or dogs or is it more just like a nuisance type of thing you don't want them in the house like t tell me a little bit about that you're like okay so so you're more prevention than you are about like you had a big problem and that's why you signed up. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And in terms of like services in general on your home, what's the thing that you really pride yourself most in having? Like, is it, do you want the highest quality service or are you trying to just like, as long as I have something to make the wife happy, what does that look like? So these questions are very different compared to like, if the person's like, dude, we have ants right now and my company, they just treated, I think I'm locked in a contract. I don't even know what to do. What questions would I ask then? I still want to follow the same method of Intel gathering. But now, instead of believing that they're really in a contract, I'm going to try to find out more about their situation. Man, I'm so sorry to hear that. So, like, just so that I can best understand to see if I can even serve you, um, do, how long have you actually been with your company? I have no clue. And uh, we can figure that out later. But, like, what did you sign up with them for? Like, what's the big problem? It sounds like you're still having it. Yeah, it's just this. And why are you concerned about that? Uh, it's because of this. Okay, cool. So, can you get your phone for me real quick so I can see when you signed up? 
Now, if I ask them to get their phone right away, will they even give it to me? No, because I haven't deepened rapport yet. So are you seeing how like this, so, but I'm viewing this as a checkpoint with that customer rather than, well, I got to ask this question. Okay, so you've seen your service treat, right? And they're like, no, I just told you I don't want to use them, but I, I think I have a contract. Why would you ever ask that question? You've seen them treat, they just spray this and this and this. And like, yeah, that's why it's like, that's not where we're, that doesn't help the customer at all. But I still need to do intel gathering. Follow me here? Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and they will not only love you, they will stay with Moxie for a very long time. The This solves attrition, cancellation, chargeback rates. It solves people not getting serviced. It solves, it helps you feel, honestly, it, it really, in my opinion, it just helps you feel really good about the job, actually. Um, and it's a lot more fun. Um, what questions do you guys have related to this idea of taking people through checkpoints rather than checking boxes when you're selling? What are some things that you'd like to know more about like in future trainings? Yeah, Isaac. <laughs> um, what's a, what's one that comes to mind? Do you know what your goal is this summer uh, yet? Yeah, like in, just off the top of your head, I know you just signed, but like off the top of your head, what, what do you think you'd like to do? How much do you think you'd like to make? Okay. Okay. Um, I mean, that's a pretty audacious goal for a rookie. To make 150K, you don't need to be very good at the back half of the sale. And I know there's people like you guys in here are like, yeah, but I haven't made 150K yet and I got the front half of the sale down pat. It's like, no, I'm actually serious. You don't, you can sell five to eight accounts a day being really good at the front half of the sale. How much did you make if you sell five accounts a day? If you sell five accounts a day and they actually get service for 118 days straight, typically is what like a, a relatively good full summer is, you're going to make 150K. Yeah, so like you don't have to be very good at the back half of the sale. But again, so the, like so I would focus all of your time. If I'm giving like advice to how I would approach training as a rookie or even um, as you're really trying to understand these concepts for the first time, go through module seven, but the, the condensed script and master that perfectly first and be able to say it in a way that sounds like you as, as yourself. And then go master the more complex version of the front half of the sale. You need to get the script down first. That's always the most important part. But that's where most people get left behind is they just stop there. Um, and then the next step is understanding what are the things that I'm supposed to be doing? Like what is happening at every level of the sale at the, each checkpoints? Okay, I know building trust. I have a bunch of tools to build trust. But if you understand that you have to build trust before you move on to intel gathering, that changes things, right? Let me give you a story about how I, this really was driven home for me. Um, so, uh, I was training Matteo Rasmussen. He took the script that I wrote in the modules and he then, he didn't really change it, but he like changed my way of thinking about it. So he serviced 1,243 accounts with that script. And, um, he went through a bunch of other training too, but much like I did, like when I built out this training, I went and bought everything I could possibly find on sales to try to understand, understand it. And, what I realized was most of the stuff is crap and there are very few things that make sense for door-to-door -door, is what I realized, especially door-to-door -door sales training. Door-to-door -door sales trainers are just, they're the worst, um, typically. Uh, yeah, as I, I still believe that. But so basically as Mateo went through, I role-played with him after he serviced 1243 and I was like, dude, give me, you know, and there's a, on my YouTube channel, there's there's a couple videos of me role-playing with him. You can go search them. Um, but I was the customer, and so I'm going to give you an example of what, what, we, ha what we did. Because I was still viewing it as like, if I just do these things well, I can just go through them and check the boxes, and it'll work really well. And that was happening because I was pretty good relatively at these things, right? But Mateo saw it differently. So he would give his intro, and I would, he, who's role-played with me in here before? Like, like actual role-play? Okay, so you know I like to be different types of customers, and I'll throw different stuff at you. So I was a tough customer. I was like, hey, what do you want? And he's like... Hey man, how are you today? 
I really want to know tonality. I'm like, great, okay, great job, man. But I'm still, I'm a hard nosed customer. So that's not going to do it for me. I'm fine. What do you need? And, and then instead of moving on, because what would you normally do there? I'm fine. What do you need? You already asked him a question, right? So what do you, what would you guys typically do? Hey, yeah, I'm Hayden. Uh, it's Moxie, you know, the blue trucks. And you're just hoping that finally they listen. They're like, get off, dude. Just go get off my porch. I, like, I'm, I'm sick of you guys. So this is what Mateo did. He's like, um, hey, how you doing today? I'm like, I'm fine. Um, I'm, not, I'm not interested in whatever you're selling. He's like, is, there, is, everything, are, is everything okay? I can come back later if you want. I was like, what? I would never teach someone to do that. And so I was like, I mean, I, what, what is it? Like, what are you selling? He's like, is, is there, like, seriously, I can if you want me to. I'm like, dude, I've never taught anyone to sell this way. It's like, dang it. And then, and then in my mind, I'm dejected because I'm like, frick, he wasn't actually using the script. So now I got to go see what really works and rewrite everything. Gosh, dang it. But then, so we, we went through and we did a few more and I was like, Hey, help me understand what you were doing there. And he's like, what I was doing is trying to gain your trust. And I knew I didn't have it. And so I can't, how am I supposed to do Intel gathering if I don't have your trust? And I was like, it just, this light bulb went off in my mind. I was like, Oh, frick. These are the checkpoints. Yeah. These are checkpoints rather than checking boxes. And I was just in the habit of checking boxes. And so now imagine like there's this rule that as a leader, everybody does things the best that everyone else will do is about 80% of what you are the best at. Because typically, we don't have a 100% skill set of teaching people what we are 100% good at. So at best, they'll do 80%. And so I started thinking like, well, if I'm checking boxes, what's everybody else doing? They're probably not going through the training seriously enough to even understand exactly what to do. Then let alone, they're not going through it to get proficient at the script and like train on it on their own time. And so they're still checking boxes, but half the old script, half the new one, and they're dejected because it's not working. And I was like, there's just a fundamentally different way we got to train this. And it has to be taking people through checkpoints. So then I role played with him more and he started doing this in Intel gathering. And he was asking like very detailed questions. It's like, so when your company comes out, I'm familiar with how Terminix treats. They usually just do this, this, and this. But like, tell me really though, is that actually what they do? Some people, they do more. Some people, they do less. Like, what do they actually do for your home? And I was like amazed, like frick, dude. Because normally in the script, what is it? It's like, you seen them spray, they do this and this. Is there anything special they do for you? But he, if I said like, no, I don't think so. And then he would just, if I wasn't engaged, he would ask it again. He's like, no, I really need to know though. Do, do they do anything extra on top of that? Because in the script, what is it? Do they do anything extra, anything special, right? But he would wait until he actually got an answer. It's like, do they do anything special on top of that? I'd be like, well, I'm not sure. No, but like, I actually have to know, like, is do you feel like you're getting a better service than what you paid for? Or is it like kind of exactly what you paid for? Like you, this helps me understand how I can best serve you. I'm like blown away because he was actually, he was selling to me rather than selling a service. Does that make sense? So that fundamentally changed everything about this. And so I went out this last uh, summer and just sold for like three weeks ish. And was for those of you that know of how sick I was, I was in a pretty bad place, but I still serviced 130 accounts just because of that change in mindset in three weeks and not knocking full days even close. Um, so that was just a huge, it was like a paradigm shift for me. And I thought like, man, if we could all master that, it would just be a game changer. It's like, you can't move on until you have trust. And then after that, you can't move on until you know enough about the service, about what their situation is and how we can best serve them. And then after that, then it makes sense to say, hey, listen, based on everything you just told me, you're going to love this, I promise. Um, and, and let me tell you why. And now you're going to go into a presentation that actually makes sense to them because they just told you everything, right? I mean, it's just a, yeah, fundamentally a game changer. Um, what would you guys like to know about the specifics of this going forward though, so that I can best serve you guys in trainings that are more tailored towards your group? Yeah. I think, um, just like what it looks like. Okay, cool. So like if someone doesn't, okay, so this goes to a good point. You're asking, what does it look like if you don't get through the checkpoint with your first attempt, basically, right? This is fundamentally why I am including smoke screens, cutting through smoke screens in your intro. You guys, did you get how profound this like This is like, I'm like a giddy schoolgirl thinking about this because it's so cool actually thinking of it this way. Because what's the point of the introduction? Trust, right? So like, if someone is giving me smoke screens, do they trust me yet? No. So I can't actually move on until they really trust me. At least I, I can't move on in a, any reasonable sort of way until they have, I have at least a little bit of trust built up with them. So, cause what happens on the doors guys, right? It's like, 
hey, I'm Hayden. Ah, oh, no, no, I'm not interested. But most of you guys will say, well, my intro's done. Now I'm on to what? Features and benefits. So you're like, no, 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 I'm not interested. Listen, that's totally fine. No, the reason why everybody's going with us is because of blah, 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 blah. And you just totally skipped. Not only did you skip Intel gathering, so you have no clue how the service is going to help them. You're just really hoping and praying. Fingers crossed. Hopefully they buy. And then when you get to the close, you're like, <laughs> the close is so stressful because you're like, freak, if they don't, if they don't say yes here then i have to come up with some crazy one-liner to try to fit and what if i do that then i blow it and then they're not going to buy i'm like i better just leave now and you're just like you know and then you give up you don't really you don't give up and walk away but you definitely give up there still so you've you've skipped like two sections of the checkpoints that you need in order for the presentation to even make sense to them because you just cut through it so that's why i've included smoke screens cutting through smoke screens in your intro because that's part of building trust. If someone comes out and you're in halfway through your intro, they cut you off and they're like, hey, I'm not interested. You're the fifth guy that stopped by. Hey, that's totally fine. And I understand that there's a lot out here. Um, do you guys use somebody right now or are you just going through it and like kind of treating yourself? You know, no, no, I'm really not interested. So then I'm going to back up and be like, you know, I don't want to waste your time here. A lot of people are really using the service because they love it. But I, I and I genuinely love to see if it's a good fit for you. Um, let me just ask you a question. So now I'm going to test, did I, do I have enough trust to move on to Intel gathering? Not going to go to features and benefits yet. Just following me here. I'm rambling a lot, but again, it's because I know it's on video, so you can go back and listen and watch it over again. Questions on that? How confusing is it? Yeah. No, I definitely really love that. I think just like, I want to just try and apply this in like a regular life. Just <laughs> try and like talk to people, like figure out what they're thinking. Yeah. And just kind of ask questions, and I think that'd be really cool to apply it is. And the reason I'm excited about that you said that is because this is not what we said. Like, when would we train Abram? A couple nights ago? Saturday? Right? What was the thing I said you should probably consider doing and that we'll have a commitment to do soon? Go go talk to – go to every day. If you want to get really good at this, practicing this, is this is what I would like you guys to do before the summer, is go awkwardly introduce yourself to five people that you don't know and practice building rapport with them in four to seven seconds. Like, hey, I know this is so awkward. I'm really sorry, but um, my name is Luke, and uh, I just noticed you were watching. But so you're gonna have to come up with ways to do it. But that's the whole point. Why does that feel awkward? Is because you're like, well, I'm not selling them something. So like, what would I even talk about? Yeah, exactly. That's the point. So that's that's exactly why it feels awkward when you go on the doors and you're like, hey, nice car, and like, oh, my dad has a car like that too. It's like, yeah, it's nothing relevant to what the actual interaction should be. That's the very same thing as going up to someone and feeling awkward about introducing yourself and building rapport because it doesn't make sense. Like you're thinking, oh, I'm, I'm not selling them something. Well, it wouldn't make sense to sell them something because that's not the interaction. The interaction is something else. So it forces your mind to figure out what makes sense to build rapport in this relationship with this person that I don't know. Does that make sense? So it gets your mind thinking about that. And again, you're focused on them, not on you. Um, but I would highly recommend that if you're trying to get good at this. It's like pick five people you don't know every day and try to build trust with them quickly and then you can even go further you can do intel gathering you can so you come up with an objective is like i'm going to try it's like you guys you can be like, i'm going to try to get this girl's number or um you could say like i'm going to try to go that's a stupid one because really what you should do is like i'm gonna try to go make this person's day today and how could i do that and so you're trying to figure out how you can do that right it's like i want this interaction to be like this person goes home and like man i'm so glad that i met isaac today Okay, that's your objective. Just like on the doors, your objective would be to make someone's life better with our service. Okay, so now how do you go build rapport, do intel gathering, and then give them a solution for the info that you ha gathered based on the objective of wanting to make their day better? Um, but this is the stuff I mean with like, if you guys are really serious about selling, I'm not, to, again, this is not the four a day sales training. If you're really serious about like actually killing it this year and really reaching the potential that you just haven't, maybe you haven't even thought about, like do the things that I'm, t I'm saying the random things I'm spitting off as, subjections, uh, uh, as suggestions, like go do 